You know, a lot of people see those family crests and the websites or internet. Well, this is one of the books that has those crests that contains those images. I have the other books I showed in other videos. Uh, this is the crest of Great Britain and Ireland, the Dominion of Canada, India, and Austra Australasia. Australasia, derived from best authorities and family records. All right. This is an official, the Fairbairns or Fairbairns uh, crest, family crest. My right, collection, this is one of them right here. All right, the Archer. Now, if you go to the book, you can see what family it is. Number five, it'll tell you in the book. You can go check it out. All right, these ain't slaves, these are family crest, you know. All right, and so this is an example of one of the pages just wanted to show you guys how i zoomed in into some of them the, the whole book is filled with this all right and this is a close-up of number seven all right so what i'm what i've been trying to tell everybody is you know so what happened to all these dynastic so-called black families and all these dark welsh and these swarthy europeans you know that they just disappear and go to africa is that what we're gonna believe is that is that what we're logically gonna say and and and, and because we're when we're 
talking about indentured servitude and Europeans coming over here, I'm not just talking about light-skinned, pale Europeans. I'm talking about what they were calling the Black Dutch, the Swarthy Germans, the Black Irish, the Black Scots. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands, I'm telling you. We've got the numbers, if you've, in case you haven't seen my videos of white servitude, indentured servitude. And I got a lot more coming. Uh, and it's just overwhelming the amount of so-called black Europeans that were sent over here. To work in plantations. Tobacco, sugar plantations to be, con you know, as convict prisoners of war. These, these Jacobites and all that. I'm going to show you today the muster rolls. All right. We're going to we're going to show you what they what they look like, what they're described as. All right. Very famous uh, family crest book of you know Great Britain, all right. And so again, this is what you find in this book, you know, different crest, all right. And we're gonna zoom into a couple of them again, all right. Now, when I be saying, do you remember who you are? All right, we're all in the journey, right? We're all learning. I'm I'm a student too. It doesn't mean I got all the answers just because I got all these videos and I'm reading all these books. I am I'm continuing to learn and I'm trying to see I'm starting to see a bigger picture here. A real bigger picture. All right. And I hope that everybody understands what I'm saying and showing. This is another crest right here. Yes, these crests are associated to surnames. Um so again, but I just wanted to go straight to the source because a lot of people you know, would say, well, that's how do we know that's real? And, you know, we, you know, we got this from the archives. They scanned that book. The seals are open. <laughs> Was this the Triune? Number 14. This means something, though. All right. Again, this is what it looks like. Again, this is the Royal Book of Crest of Great Britain and Ireland, Dominion of Canada, India, and Australasia, derived from the best authorities and family records by James Fair. Burn, all right, 1883. 1883. Now, this book is uh, a description of the Western Islands of Scotland, containing a full account of their situation. Uh, let me see, extent, soils, product, harbors, bay. All right, and it keeps going. So, this is from uh, M, uh, Martin Martin, I believe his name is. Yeah, and from 1716. All right, this book is from 1716. You can find it on archive.org. It says the inhabitants of this ISO are generally well proportioned and their complexion is for most part black. And this is a crest, right? This is an example. I threw this in there. This is the coat of arms of Ive of or Ivy William, 1485, the Ivy family. The same book, a description of the Western Islands of Scotland. And we're talking about the Isle of Aran or the island of Aran. It says the inhabitants of this Isle are well proportioned, generally brown and some of black complexion. They enjoy a good state of health and have a genius for all callings or, or employee. All right. Brown or black complexion. And the Isle of Gigay. It says the inhabitants are all protestants all right protestants remember that protestant i've been telling to tell you guys when i say protestants because a lot of the times i'll be like oh we had a shipload of protestants come from ireland or whatever and we just oh a bunch of white people right that's what we're all assuming and that's what i'm trying to help break that spell the inhabitants are all protestants and speak the irish tongue generally there being but a few that speak english they are grave and res reserved in their conversation. They are 
accustomed not to bury on Friday. They are fair or brown in complexion and use the same habit diet that is made use of the adjacent continent isos. All right. And it says about a league further of the south. All right. So this is about the island of Judah. It almost sounds like the island of Judah. Just replace the R with a D. Judah. Judah. Says the natives here are very well proportioned, being generally black of complexion and free from bodily imperfections. They speak the Irish language and wear the plaid, the plaid bonnet, as other islanders. All right, the plaid. All right, they they made that up. You know that's <laughs> that plaid clothing. It says the cattle bred here are cows. The horses, sheep, and all those sides. The inhabitants are generally well proportioned and of a black complexion. They speak only the Irish tongue. Black complexion, right? In Judah, the island of Jura. It says, origin of the Anglo-Saxon race. A study of the settlement of England and the tribal origin of the old English people. By the late Thomas William Shore. Author of a history of Hampshire, etc. Honorary Secretary, London and Middlesex Archaeological Society. Honorary organizing secretary of the hampshire uh, field club and archaeological society edited by his sons tw shore and le shore all right this is from 1906 so it says here chapter seven in the same book our darker forefathers continuing that book very scholarly book it says the consideration of the evidence that people of brunette complexions were among the anglo-saxon settlers in england leads on to that of people of a still darker hue the dark black or brown black settlers probably there must have been some of these among the anglo-saxons for we meet with the personal names black men black men blakeman blackaman blackasunu blacka and blatchiman or blatchman in various documents of the period all right blacka was an elf dormant of lindsay who was converted by paulinius Blackman was the son of Elric El Eldric, a descendant of Ida, ancestor of Elred, king of Bernicia, and so on. The same kind of evidence is met with among the oldest place names. Blackamnerberg is mentioned in Anglo-Saxon charter. There's another old word used by the Anglo-Saxons to denote black or brown black. The word swart. All right, we know that. The swarty, right? Swart. The personal name Suart or Suart may have been derived from this word. They're saying steward, right? The stewards. Suart, Suart, Swart, which means black. So this word may be derived from that and may have originally denoted people of a dark brown or black complexion. Some names of this kind are mentioned in the Doomsday Record of Buckinghamshire and Lincolnshire. These may be of Scandinavian origin. For the Ikinami or nickname Swarti is found in the Northern Sagas. Havden the Black was the name of King of Norway, who died in 863. The so called black men of the Anglo Saxon period probably included some of the darker Wendish people, among them immigrants or descendants of people of the same race as the ancestors of the Sorbs of Lausatia. All right. So I know I'm reading and I hope people's understanding, but let us know that there was black Anglo-Saxon. As late as time of the Doomsday Survey, we meet with records of people apparently named after their dark complexions. In Buckinghamshire, Black Blakeshiman, Swartinus, Swartinus, the Swartiness, right? And others are mentioned in Sussex, one named Black in Suffolk, Blackemanus and Swartikungus, and others at Lincoln, the invention the invasion of the coast of the British Isles by the Vikings of a dark or black complexion rests on historical evidence, which is too circumstantial to admit of doubt. All right. All right. This scholar from all these historical societies is letting you know. Black Vikings, right? Dark skinned Vikings. There's too much historical evidence which is too circumstantial to admit of doubt, all right? He's already letting you know it's too much evidence. But but, but what happened throughout history? What did they teach us? All the circumstantial evidence that he knew about. This is from the 1800s, right? So why didn't they teach us that there were black Vikings? Why did they always show white Vikings? 
All right. In the Irish annals, the Black Vikings are called Dub Genti or Black Gentiles. These Black Gentiles on some occasions fought against other plunderers of the Irish coast known as the Fair Gentiles, who can hardly have been others than the Fair Danes or Northern Northmen. In the year 851, oh, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to point out that uh, you might be mindful that still anybody who's following you, that the word Gentile only means somebody who does not believe the way doesn't believe the same as the person that they're invading or the invader doesn't believe that's what and they, so they call one another gentiles or pagans yeah exactly that's from the view of what somebody would call a hebrew right what they were called gentile depending on you know what they're saying we'd have to analyze who's saying what right real talk real talk and then it says here that they're saying that it might be the fair Danes they encountered in the year 851. The black Gentiles came to Athcliath, Dublin. Example, Dublin. So that's the name, Dublin. In 852, we are told that eight ships of the Finn Genti arrived. We're talking about black Vikings and fought against the Dub Genti for three days. And that the Dub Genti were victorious. The black Vikings appear at this time to have had a settlement in or close to Dublin. And during the 9th century were much in evidence on the Irish coast. In 877, a great battle was fought at Loch Cuan between them and the fair Gentiles, in which Alban, chief of the black Gentiles, fell. He may well have been a chieftain of the race of the northern sorbs of the Mecklenburg coast. Doomsday Book tells us whose Carls in Buckinghamshire and a people who bore such names as Swarting, Suart or Suan, Suart and Suart among its land holders. And it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that such names refer to people of dark complexions. All right. If they got last names like Suart, Stuart, Suart, all right, it's hard to avoid that they have dark complexions. All right. And what does it say here? Family names from the Irish, Anglo Saxon, Anglo Norman, and Scotch. Considered in relations to their etymology, with brief remarks of the history and languages, peoples to whom we are indebted for their origin by Thomas G. Gentry. This is from 1892. This guy is an uh, author of life histories of uh, birds of Assyrian Pennsylvania, the house of sparrow, notes and eggs. And All right, so he's a bird specialist, but <laughs> he also does this on the side. Now it says here, Dever, originally Duber, from Dub, which means black, Dub, black, like Dublin, the city of Dublin is the city of black, Dub, man, a dark complexion man, Dubur, Dubur, Dub, a dark complexion man, Degan, all right, and it says here, Deflin, Dub, black, Lynn, marsh, or swamp. Mm, just like more also means swamp, a wasteland. That's another definition for more. Just like dub also means a marsh because you know what? A lot of these dark-skinned people were living along marshes along and it was becoming associated to them as well. So the word meant a lot more than just meaning a wasteland or a marsh. All right. Dub, and we're going to get to that either today or tomorrow. So dub black lin and marsh song said dub duffy duffy is also like duff duff dub pronounced dub or dupe or black dub black an individual a black person a black dub all right dugal or douglas right douglas right douglas from black dark glass green gray dark green dark gray Dugal. So Douglas means black too. Douglas. Dugla. Dugal from Dub. Black Gaul. Stranger. A black stranger. Dugal from the same roots. All right. And it says here Dub. We already know what? The black. Black. King of Scotland. Black. <laughs> what do they mean? Black. <laughs> Nobody's named Black. His name was Dub Mac Mail Colum. Or the Black Mac Mill Kaloon. Let's let's not forget the movie uh, that uh, uh, the brother played in uh, called King of Scotland that was played yeah. by uh, Forrest Whitaker. You, you remember? 
Yeah, the king, the new King's Calling, or something like that. Yeah, which was just played by Forrest Whitaker. Yeah. In, in the movie, he's an African king, but he's called the King of Scotland because of his relation with family members from Scotland. Exactly. There you go. Subliminal Hollywood. You already know the Hollywood. Because <laughs> it's reality dub King of Scotland. Black King of Scotland. Dub Mac Mill. What? Dub Mac Mill Coolum. What? Sometimes anglicized as Dub Mac Malcolm. Called then the vehement the Niger. On <laughs> the Black was king of Alba. He was son of Malcolm the first and succeeded to the throne when Indulf was killed. Well, we already know Malcolm. What kind of name that is. Right? <laughs> son of Malcolm. All right. And he was, yeah, a known so-called black Scottish king. All right? This is his genealogy. You see, like, he's actually a real person in history, you know? And this picture is not even around anymore. They used to have this in Wikipedia. They took it down. But this was a representation that were, I think, making fun of him or something uh, in this book. In that time, they did it. The King of Scotland. But when you Google it and the little box on the Google page, you'll still see this. But when you click on it, it's gone. So I took a screenshot of the little. It says, Dub King of Scotland. Dub McMill. Sometimes anglicized as Dub McMillan. The very human. The Niger the Black was King of Alpha. All right, dub. We already know that means black. Dub King of Scotland, Dub Macmillan, modern Gaelic dub. Sometimes anglicized as Dub Macmillan. All right, was King of Alba. He was the son of Milk, and we got that. The history of legend of Scotland confirmed the existence of purely black people. We see one of them in the person of Kenneth the Ni Ni Niger. During the 10th century, Kenneth the Niger ruled over three provinces in the Scottish Highlands. The archaeologist and writer David McRitchie declared that the Moors dominated Scotland as late as the time of the Saxon kings. He stated with scholarly authority so late as the 10th century. Three of these provinces of Scotland were wholly black, and the supreme ruler of these became for a time the paramount king of the transmarine Scotland. We see one of the black people, the Moors of the Romans, in the person of King of Album of the 10th century history knows him as Kenneth, sometimes as Dub, as the Niger. We known as historic fact that a Niger Valdu was has lived and reigned over certain black divisions of our islands and probably white divisions also, and that a race known as the Sons of the Black succeeded him in history. All right, so now we're in this book. I thought it was a great find. Uh, it's called Memoirs of the Secret Service of John McKee or McKay during the reigns of King William. Queen Anne and King George I, including also the true secret history of the rise promotions of the English and Scots, nobility, officers, civil, military, naval, and other persons of distinction from the revolution in their respective characters at large, drawn up by Mr. Mackay, pursuant to the direction of Her Royal Highness and the Princess Sophia. I published from his original manuscript and attested by his son, Spring McKee, Esquire, the second edition. And this is printed in 1733. All right. This is the Roman numeral 1733. So this is the author of the book, John McKee. Again, we're at the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. This is actually a PDF. There's so many volumes, but they have an online version. But you need access to it with a university. But either way, it says that he's a, a writer, a spy. All right. A spy was a Scot of obscure birth, parentage, and education, he fled from France to London in the summer of 1682 with the first news of the intended French and Jacobite, Jacobite invasion from Lagu. Again, John McKee, government agent or spy, and this is from the Dictionary of Natural Biography, 1885, volume 35, alright. Um, he, the author of Memoirs of Secret Services, that's what we're going to read right now. Down here is what I want to read. It says he's the author of somewhat important contribution to contemporary history, Memoirs of the Secret Service of John McKee. It says the chief value of the memoirs consists in his description of the leading personages of the period. All right. This is the chief value. All right. Pay attention because we're about to read some deep stuff. So chief value. All right. Is descriptions of the leading personages. The descriptions. That's the value in this. All right. Which evidence both keen powers of observation and great impartiality of judgment. All right, he was not lying and he wasn't trying to 
uh, you know, hide anything or had an agenda. He was being true with what he was seeing and reporting. All right. Remember, he's a spy. He has to report what he sees. So we can find this book we're about to read in all the digital uh, archive libraries. This is the New York Public Library. The Royal Collection Trust, they also have a copy here. All right, there's another copy here you can get. It says here, the description says, this work has been selected by scholars as being culturally important and is part of the knowledge base of civilization as we know it. And this is the Amazon version. And uh, when you look inside, you know, there's nothing. <laughs> they don't show you. Trust me, there's some deep stuff in here. They don't want to show you right now. So I just want to read a little bit of the history of this book before we got into it. Very important. And, you know, I remember he was a spy. He was saying that he was writing what, you know, he was seeing. So we're not going to read the whole thing. But basically the book explains that he found out that they were going to invade uh, London with the help of France or some places. And, 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 you know, he snitched on them. And, you know, King William was able to beat these guys, the Jacobites. But we're going to get to some very important parts of the book. All right, so we're going to begin with this uh, person right here, which he's describing. His, his name is uh, Charles known as the Duke of Somerset, master of the horse, of the ancient family of Seymour, who made so great a figure in the reign of Edward VI. I remember, these are the people he's spying on. So these are the Jacobites, all right? We're gonna go ahead, all right? And get to this part of the book where it describes what he looks like. It says, he is of middle stature, well-shaped and very black complexion, very black complexion. A lover of music and poetry, of good judgment, but reason of great hesitation in his speech. Once expression, he is about 42 years old. All right. Who, what is he? Very black complexion. All right. The Duke of Somerset. Again, very black complexion. All right. Remember, this is historically accurate what he's writing. He's a spy and he's writing to King William. Very black complexion. The next person uh, we're going to talk about and he's going to describe is uh, Sidney, Lord Godolphin, Lord High Treasurer, a treasurer of England. We're going to go. All right. So it talks about him. It says he has an admirable, clear understanding of slow speech with an awful, serious deportment. Thus more than he promises an enemy to flattery, show, them, show, show and violence of very hard access. But that being equally deemed to all degrees of people makes it supportable of a low stature. Then with a very black and stern countenance, with a very black and stern countenance, near 60 years old. All right. He's very what? Very black. All right. The next person here is Daniel, Earl of Nottingham, Secretary of State. It says that he has also the exterior air of business and application enough to make him very capable and his habit and manners very formal a tall thin very black man he's a very black man like a spaniard or a jew about 50 years old like a spaniard more or like a jew like a more he was a very black man <laughs> a very black very black expression right to these books uh, by lee cummins a lot of you've seen his books, you know, The Negro Question, and there's like about six, seven, eight parts. The world history that is being taught in the classrooms omit the existence of the Black Scots, Black Irish, Black Brits, Black Italians, Black French, or Black Europeans that were sold directly into the American slave plantations. Again, what had I been saying? Who was really coming in over here in ships? by the thousands and thousands and thousands that was Europeans, both black and pale skinned Europeans, not just black, all right? But also not just white. So it says here, the Scottish Kings of England. All right, so here he has a picture of uh, uh, King James, all right? All right, so this is an image he has here of King James, all right? So he got a little curly hair and stuff, so they're showing here. So James, by the grace of God, King of England, all right? He says, I know that this image of a black King James can be a little confusing because of your Western education, but this is the truth that is known by the rich and the elite in the world. That was the reason I paraded all the of the English historians and professors before you before I got into the bowels of this book. I had to get your mind ready to receive the truth. King James came from a long line of black Scottish Stuart kings, sorry, the Stuarts. 343 years of rulership in Scotland. The Stuarts not only ruled in Scotland, they ruled France, Spain, and Ireland, and England, Britain, and Wales. King James was able to rule all these lands because of all these people were of Iberian 
black descent. All right, so we're all day from Iberian, or did some of them come from Atlantis <laughs> or America? All right, they were the same people. If you look at the ball in his hand, it represents world rulership, and there was only one other group of world leaders who used this type of symbolism, and they were the Byzantine Roman emperors. Remember, they told the English that they were Roman citizens. This is the proof. All right, so he's saying these Britons had something to do with the Edomians or Edomites. So this is one of the signs of scholarship when you're able to read the symbolism of images. In my research, I found out that the ancient Scottish was a tribe from northeastern Ireland, which means the Scots are really Irish. So if I have seen an ancient Scot, I have seen an ancient Irishman. And if I have seen an ancient Irishman, then I have seen an ancient Briton. All right, it says here, chapter three, Oliver Cromwell. So his history records that after the execution of Charles I of Scotland and England, that Oliver Cromwell invaded Scotland killed 4,000 men and took 10,000 captive. For some inexplicable reason, it took Cromwell one year to end the war in Scotland. What I do know, and I am certain of, is that he deported the Scots to American colonies. These black Europeans were sent to Barbados, Boston, Charlestown, Cambridge, Concord, Hingham, Ipswich, Virginia, Newark, and the Southern Plant Plantations, all right, we got this again the primary sources of this real history on my previous videos of white servitude and black masters Check it out. There's four parts so far. These are the facts ladies and gentlemen These Scottish blacks are among us in the Americas and we are ignorant of their existence as well as they are Listen to what he's saying. It has been reported that in the african-american community so-called african-american, right? A lot of blacks have Scottish and Irish last names uh, it's very interesting uh, book because it correlates with what we've been learning. All right. And again, um, we're not here to like basically try to debate. We're not trying to debate what we already know to be true. We're not trying to debate people who want to be stuck in a in a story, right? Like in a storyline, we never show any sources, never. Or if they're just if their personal history is is that, you know, that's their personal history. That doesn't mean everybody else's history is that. You know, so, you know, come with respect. Now, we're not here to play games and be sarcastic or anything. We're here to build and learn. And, uh, you know, if you want to present some sources, you know, you're free to do your own video so we can look at the information and verify it ourselves uh, with the uh, sources that you present, you know, so we could uh, see if it's, uh, you know, legit or what it is, if it's, you know, fairy tales or what, you know. But, uh, yeah, well, we just, you know, always got to talk sources. Now, I got this book right here. All right, it's called The Jacobite Gleanings from State Manuscripts, Short Sketches of Jacobite, The Transportations in 1745 by Jake Macbeth Forbes. All right, I actually have the passenger list, the ship list from 1745 of the Jacobites. All right, and there's something very interesting in here. All right. This is from the Harvard College Library from the bequest of Thomas Rand Ward. All right. And again, when we're talking about these people right here, we ain't talking about Africans. Right? It says the Jacobite gleanings from state manuscripts, short sketches of Jacobite, the transportations in 1745 by J. Macbeth. An exact list and description of 150 rebel prisoners shipped at Liverpool on board the veteran John Rickey, master for the Leeward Islands, which were taken near Antigua the 28th June last by the Diamond Privateer Paul Marcelli, commander and carried into Martinico the 30th June of 1747. All right. What are we going to see here? The passenger list of all these prisoners, Jacobites. Now, let's see. It says name, age, profession, the county, the statue, remarks. So any other thing, right? And number one, just for example, we're going to start with number one. It says Robert Adam, 18. He was 18. He was a laborer. County, he's from Sterling. He was five feet, one inch, very short. He's brown. He's brown. Smooth face, right? He's brown. All right? He's brown. William Bell, 46 Weaver, Berwick, 5'4". He's black with curled hair. He's strong made. All right? Douglas, Dougal, or Dougal. We already know about Dougal. Dugo Campbell, servant, Lockerbur, 5'4". He's also brown complexion, well-made and ruddy, brown complexion. Alex Katana, 
17. All right, young. These are young. Miller. Bandanock. All right, he's from Bandanock. He's 5'5". Five five. He's black, ruddy. Black, ruddy. All right. A lot of you is probably still saying, well, that probably means white. Well, we'll see. All right, we'll see. Dugo Campbell. Dugo. Douglas. Dugo. Dugo. <laughs> swarty, swarty, right? He's a servant. Argyle. He's 5'5", five five, one fourth. He's brown also. And also ruddy. Healthy. Well made and ruddy, it says, I guess. Alex Campbell. All right. We already know about the Campbells. We just read that, right? 18. He's a laborer. Inverness, 548. He's pock pitted. He's pock pitted. Whatever that means. John Campbell, he's 20. He's 5'2. He's swarthy. All right. He's swarthy. There's no saying, oh, well, that black means, no, swarthy. He's swarthy. Alex Cameroon, he's well made. He's swarthy because this doo doo, brown, 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 swarthy, brown, pock picket. Oh, I guess so. These are all brown people. See that? The DO is diddle, diddle, diddle. All right, William Dickinson, red hair, thick set and healthy. Alex David Davidson, he's ruddy and slim made. Andrew Edwards, he's black, well made, strong. All right, Alex Goodbrand. All right, so I want you to see all these people, right? All these people, look at the names. Brown, black, brown, black, brown, black, thin, black, black, brown, ditto, ditto, ditto and so on and so on and so on do you see any of your last names here these are jacobites you understand what a jacobite is huh this is a long list i'm trying to tell you all right i'm going to show you sign donald mcgillis mcdonald mcdougal all right muck 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 we already know what all that means mcdonald mckee mckee daniel mckee McKee's a, oh, a Daniel McKee. Hmm. Remember that for a future video. All right. Daniel McKee. The McKees. Who's McKees? What does that have to do with a, a, a first person to own, uh, a, what you call it, property and apartments and like project style kind of buildings? Is the McKee. He was a McKee. All right. Now, Look at this, it says black, short neck, red hair, black, light hair, well made, fair. So he's fair, right? Brown, thick, black, swarthy, slender, black, swarthy, slender. So that doesn't mean white because he can't be white, swarthy, right? Black, swarthy, brown, straight, sandy hair, brown, diddle, 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 diddle. Just a quick reminder, we're here in the American Dictionary of the English Language. All right. This is actually Webster's uh, 1828 uh dictionary all right i got the official pdf we're gonna go all the way to the word uh swarty all right and right here it says swart right almost sounds like steward swart steward swart steward is that what they get the steward did it mean black or dark what is swart it says being of dark hue moderately black tawny swart all right down here it says swart to make tawny or brown Swart in apparition. <laughs> Swartly. All right. Duskly with a tawny hue. It says swartness. Tawniness. A dusky or dark complexion. Dark complexion. All right. Dark complexion. Swarty. Being of a dark hue or dusky complexion. Tawny. In warm climates, the complexion of men is universally what? Swarty or what? Black in warm climates. Is there only warm climates in Africa? No, we have warm climates all over the world, right? The Moors, Spaniards, and Italians are more swarthy than the French, Germans, and English. This says they're swarthy hosts with dark in all our plains. Swarthy, all right, black, as the swarthy African it says, right? As the swarthy African. So the African is swarthy, right? Swarthy is a tawny color. Swartish, somewhat dark or tawny. Swarthy, swarthy, tawny, all right? So you get the picture, right? Swarthy. So an African is swarthy, right? Black. Black, straight, ditto, swarthy, lusty. <laughs> See all these uh, last names, right? See the names. Black. Pale faced. There you go. Pale faced. All right. This is pale faced. They tell you fair faced. 
pale faced. When they're pale faced, they're telling you fair, black, brown, fair complexion, pale. All right. So this, when they're saying black, it doesn't mean white or fair or pale because they're telling you when they're pale, pale complexion again. All right. Fair. Now this could be a light skinned, dark skinned person. It could just be a light skin, but they're telling you straight up pale complexion, fair. Could be straight up a white person, right? Straight up pale, a real pale person, brown, dark complexion, well-made Joseph Brown brown dark complexion well made daniel duff right what do we learn about duff and dub all right dark hair healthy brown sickly sickly wow he don't sound good well made brown complexion brown complexion all right pale hair sickly dark visage strong healthy pale complexion all right this guy's pale james man all right and the list continues there's a long list here remember how much they had dark complexion dark so what is the uh, pattern we're seeing here if anybody has noticed already you know i would ask my daughter you know what's the what is the pattern she would say well they're all dark they're all brown I'm like, yes exactly it's a majority of dark complexion. People here, brown complexion, swarthy. As you can see, these are all swarthy, dark, you know, dark complexion, black, sturdy, look, dark hair, brown, black, dark, brown, nut brown. He's a nut brown, dark hair. He's fair. Brown spring, brown. Oh, look at the last names, Reed. All right. We're not talking about Africans here just because these are dark complexion people. All right. Brown, sprightly, light brown, light brown. There you go. Even when they're light, light brown, they're getting very specific. All right. They were probably doing that for a reason. Make sure later on they'll be like, well, he's a, he's darker. Let's make him longer. Let's take, you know, he's pale. Let's, you know, you know, they were taking this for a reason. Black man, brown, light brown, dark chestnut. All right. Dark brown. Thomas, bold. You did kill. <laughs> this is Margaret Dykes, Mary McKenzie, Barbara Camel, James McIntosh. All right. It says this description was taken by Mr. Smith at Lincoln, York, and Lancaster in October 1746. All right. Primary source. Do you understand what a primary source is? These are people from that time writing this down. All right. This is not pseudo just because it's old. So a lot of people like to use that because we're reading older books that it means pseudo that automatically older books are lie or pseudo. And that's totally false. And when you hear that alarm should go off right there. You should see why is this person doing this trying to dodge me from this information why is this person trying to keep me from knowing this information this is not pseudo this is actually in a harvard library it's not under the fictional aisle i don't even think they got a full they probably do got a fictional aisle like every other library but i don't think this would be there in their fictional aisle this is history all right and they don't teach people this if they would have taught me this in school elementary school they would have shown me this and said dark 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 <laughs> you know swarthy brown i'm like well teacher that, that sounds like like a black person teacher what was she gonna say you know they don't even got the teachers trained to rebuttal stuff like this teachers can't even go outside of what they read those textbooks they're given they don't go outside of that but we're, we're going straight to the primary sources and we're not talking about Africans. All right. I'm going to read here a little bit. I don't know what it says. The list is taken from three different gals, Lincoln, York, and Lancaster. And it's likely that the first 46 prisoners whose names are all alphabetically arranged would come from Lincoln. The other names from York and Lancaster being inserted without any regard to sequence of the 135 men 
18 hailed from Perthshire, 20 from Iverness, 25 from Aberdeen, 19 from England, and one from Ireland. All right, so yeah, it tells you right here. Then I think right here says there was an Edinburgh writer, George Gumi, age 30, marked as a black man whose color would no doubt suit the West Indies. Say what? Oh, I didn't expect that one. So you hear what they just said right there. Let me go back. As to the trades represented, 55 were laborers, 11 servants, 20 weavers, 4 herdsmen, 2 gentlemen, number 105, John Mackenzie, 22, Ross Shire, well-made gentle. They had numbers. You see that? They had numbers, a property. Number 111, John Osler, 20 Lincolns, brown-haired gentile. There was an Edinburgh writer, George Hume, age 30. He was marked as a black man whose color would no doubt suit the West Indies. Oh, he'll fit right in in the West Indies, this black man. You're talking about European Jacob, but that's right. We're not talking about Africans. Uh, it's called Memoirs of the Secret Service of John McKee or McKay during the reigns of King William, Queen Anne, and King George I. All right, the next person here is John, Duke of Newcastle says is this the name of host was Earl of Clare before the revolution before the revolution and married a daughter of the late Duke of Newcastle who died without heirs male King William created this gentleman a duke and gave him the garden all right so King William kind of hooked him up it says here he has the best estate in England and employs most of his time in improving it is very covetous yet makes a great figure at his seat in Yorkshire is firm for the constitution of his country and has one only one daughter who will be the richest heiress in Europe. He is a black, all right? He is a black, ruddy, black, ruddy complexion man near 60 years old. Again, he is a black, ruddy complexion man. This is the next person uh, we're going to look at. It says Charles Lennox or Charles Lennox, Duke of Richmond. It says is the son to King Charles II by Duchess of Portmouth, all right? son of king charles ii it says he is a gentleman good natured to a fault very well bred and has many valuable things in him is an enemy to business very credulous well-shaped black complexion much like king charles not 30 years old all right he's black complexion just like king charles his dad king charles was black just like him his son next person we're going to look at is charles duke of st albans all right who is also the son of King Charles II by by Miss Gwyn. Now it says Charles Duke of St. Albans. He is a gentleman very way de bon naturel, well bred, does not love business. He is well affected to the constitution of his country. He is of black complexion, not so tall as the Duke of Northumberland, yet very like King Charles. Turn 30 years old, all right? Black complexion. All right, we're here with Basil Fielden, the Earl of Denby. It says, is representative of the name and family of Fielding. He was a gentleman of the horse to the prince in the reign of King William. But on the difference between the king and him, quitted that family and has a regiment of dragoons. He is a gentleman in good nature, but is one of the greater, greatest drinkers in England. He is tall, fat, very black, and turned out 40 years old. He's very black. And we're the Earl of Kingston, all right? It says, of the name and family of Pierpoint. Pierpoint has a very good estate, is very fine gentleman of good sense, well-bred and a lover of the ladies, entirely in the interest of his country, makes good figures, is of black complexion, black complexion, well-made, not 40 years old. We got Richard Earl of Ranella. Says, as a peer of the Kingdom of Ireland, of a great deal of wit, had originally no great estate, yet has spent more money, built more fine houses, and laid out more household furniture and gardening than any other nobleman in England. He's a great epicure and prodigious expensive. All right, so down here it says he's a bold man and very happy in jest and repartees, and has often turned the humor of the House of Commons when they have designed to have been very severe he is very fat so he's a very fat guy and black it says very fat black and turns of 60 years old fat black fat and black all right a fat black guy richard earl of ranella this is uh henish finch lord gernfrey this is the second son of my lord chancellor finch brother earl of nottingham 
since he is accounted one of the greatest orators in England and good common lawyer, a firm asserter of the prerogative of the crown and jurisdiction of the church, a tall, thin black man, a tall, thin black man, splenetic, near 50 years old. Then we got Montagu Benabos Berti, Earl of Abingnon. Abingnon. So what does it say about Benaglis? All right, it says that he's a branch of the Berties, a gentleman of fine parts, makes a good figure in the counties of Oxford and Buckinghamshire, was made by the Queen come stable of the Tower of London is very high for the monarchy and church of a black complexion past 40 years old of a black complexion right here we got Mr. Matuin ambassador to the king of Portugal ambassador to the king of Portugal Mr. Matuin says that he is a man of intrigue but very muddy in his conceptions and not quickly understood in anything in his complexion and manners much of a Spaniard a tall black man 50 years old just like a Spaniard, and we're talking about Moors, most likely Spaniard. And we continue in this book, you know, Memoirs of the Secret Services of John McKay. Remember, this was the spy that uh, King William sent out there to spy on these uh, Jacobites and supporters of the King James and all that to get the throne back. And this is what he, he is describing the people that he's encountering and spying on, right? So this is, again, page 151. And Mr. Stanhope says envoy extraordinary to the states general of the united provinces his son is colonel stanhope was one of the finest young gentlemen we have is very learned with a great deal of wit king william designed to have sent him to the court of sweden and he is certainly fit for any negotiation the father is now old and the son of a handsome black man the son of a handsome black man turned of 30 years old next we got the earl of orkney lieutenant general all right is a fourth son of the late duke of hamilton and brother of the present, he was bred under his uncle and my lord Dunbarton, who died in France and after the revolution, had his regiment. He is a very well-shaped black man, is brave, but by reason of a hesitation, is his speech wants expression. So he's a black man, very well-shaped black man, really. Next, we got Rear Admiral Wishart or Wehart. All right, he was born in Scotland. And it says that he has great luck and prizes and purchases a good estate. He is a black man towards 50 year old. He's a black man, the rear Admiral Wishart. All right, so we continue. It says Marquis of Anandel, president of the council, chief of the ancient family of the Johnstown or Johnston, and fell in heartily at the revolution with King William's party. And a few months after entered into the design for restoring King James. All right, he was helping restore King James, right? He's a Jacobite, right? Which being discovered by the apprehension of Neville Payne, who was sent from England to carry it on, he submitted himself to King William, com confessed his fault and had his pardon, all right? Uh, it says that he was often out in, in the ministry during the King's reign, extremely carried away by his private interest, had good sense with a uh, manly expression, but not much to be trusted, it makes a fine figure in the Parliament House, as he does in his person being tall, lusty, and well-shaped with a very black complexion. This Jacobite supporter of King James who got caught by King William, all right, Marquis of Annandale. He is very black complexion. To continue, this is uh, Lord Belhaven. It says, it's a branch of the family of Hamilton. It was the only peer who opposed the act of su secession in Scotland when the Duke of York was present for which he was sent prisoner for the castle of Edinburgh. Oh, he didn't like King James, huh? Lord Belhaven, all right? So it says that he was been angry with the administration of the reigns, all right? So he, he was against that whole thing. So he says he's rough, fat, and black. Noisy man, more like a butcher than a lord. Turn of 30 years old, a fat black man. Continue on page 237. It says this is the Earl of Home. Is the representative of the noble family of that name, Home. He's endued with very good parts of fir a firm countryman, but never would acknowledge, acknowledge uh, King William, right? So he was a Jacobite. And it says that he is a black man of a middle stature with a sanguine complexion. He is a black man of a sanguine complexion. And one of the pleasantest companions in the world towards 60 years old. I'm just going to continue with uh, this. Now we're going back in the book because this book also has um, a lot of descriptions of them being brown yeah brown complexion so it says this is john duke of the buckinghamshire and lord privy sale very important person in those times i was made lord chamberlain by king james so 
very uh, supportive of King James. He was there during that whole thing and says that for uh, notwithstanding his great interest at court, he is certain he has none in either house of parliament or in the country. He is of middle stature of a brown complexion with four four lofty look, with a sour lofty look near 60 years old. So he's a brown complexion. We continue with John, uh, Lord Summers, the late Lord Chancellor says of a credible family in the city of Worcester. His father was attorney and bred him to the law, which was his profession for some years. Before he was taken notice of, he was retained as one of the council for the seven bishops in King James' reign and behaved themselves in the cause with so much applause as gained him very great reputation and first brought him into business. All right, so he was very known by this whole administration of King uh, James. He was obviously a supporter of King James, might be considered a Jacobite. And uh, regarding his complex, it says he is of a grave deportment, easy and free in conversation, something of a libertine and middle stature. He's a brown complexion, a brown complexion near 50 years old, right? Brown complexion. What's brown complexion? Aren't you brown complexion too? Just to finish up, it says Earl of Feversham, a third son of the family of Duran in France. He's statured, he's middle statured in brown man. He's a brown man. All right, now, there is a, a great example here. I want to show you that they also have white or fair people complexion, all right? Thomas Earl of Aylesbury in this book. So it says that he is a fair complexion, right? Fair complexion. So you guys can see they're not just making everybody black or brown, all right? George Lord Albert Gaveni, gentleman of the bedchamber to the Prince of Denmark, all right? He's a little brown. He's a little brown man, very lovely, a little brown man. We got Robert Lord Lexington. All right, son of the Sutton was a gentleman. It says that he is handsome of a brown complexion, 40 years old of a brown complexion. Robert Lord Lexington, brown complexion. Continue. We got Neville Lord Lovelands, is Lieutenant Colonel of the Horde of Guards, a very pretty gentleman of good sense and well at court, a short, fat, brown man, a short, fat, brown man. We got Ford Lord Grey of Work, all right, his brother to the late Earl of Tankerville. He's also brown, a thin brown, handsome man and brown. He's also brown. We got John Lord Ashburnham, has a great estate in Suffolk and improves it. Is a thin brown man, 50 years old. He's a thin brown man. These are all Jacobites. He's brown and black men. Next, we got Sir George Rook, is of a gentleman's family in Canterbury of no great estate, but of always well esteemed in that country. He commanded a ship at the revolution and it is believed if he had been in England when that happened, he would have been more zealous for his master King James than most of the Protestant captains were his master King James, all right? It says he had the capacity to do a great deal if he pleases to apply himself to it. He is a stern look man of a brown complexion, well-shaped and 60 years old, brown complexion. We got James Vernon Esquire, teller of the ex exchequer. He says was a clerk in the secretary of King Charles II's reign, Secretary of Duke of Monmouth, and at the Revolution was under Secretary of Duke of Shrewsbury. He's all Jacobites. All right, very important man here, James Vernon. And it's telling us here in this book that he's also a tall and thin uh, brown complexion man, all right? A brown complexion man. Now, what does Wikipedia and the internet show us? James Vernon, the executioner, the... <laughs> this is him right here. Get a close-up of the picture. Does that look like a brown complexion man to you? That's a white man they're painting. This is not the person that they're describing. This is not the person, but look at the hair. They all got these wigs and these curly, froey. It's not even straight hair. They're trying to like, you know, subliminally show somebody who might be ethnic or some way. All right. The real person is brown complexion. The proxy, the fake person is this pale faced person right here. This is not the same person. This is not the Jacobite. We got Colonel Matthew Aylmer, Vice Admiral of the Fleet. Says he commanded a ship in the reign of King James as well. This book, this person, John McKee is telling us this person is a brown man. All right, he's a brown man, Colonel Matthew Aylmer. And again, once again, the textbook shows something else. Matthew Aylmer, the first Baron Aylmer, Royal Navy. This is what they're showing us. This is not a brown man. What do you mean by brown and black? So what is what was their interpretation of brown and black? Because they keep showing us pale faced people, right? White people, white, Caucasian, white, pale, 
face people. He's supposed to be a brown man. This guy's supposed to be a brown man. This guy's supposed to be a brown man. You see the hijack? Marquis of Tweedale. Tweedale, all right? Branch of the ancient and noble family of Hay. This guy is also is named by the queen to be Lord High Chancellor, a short brown man towards 60 years old. A short brown man. The Marquis of Tweedy. Tweedale. Next we got Andrew Fletcher of Salton is a gentleman of the fair state in Scotland attended with the improvement of a good education. He was knight of the shire for Lothian in that parliament wherein the Duke of York was commissioner a Jacobite. It says he has written some excellent tracts but not published in his name and has a very fine genius as a Lothian brown complexion brown complexion man a brown complexion man and this is what the internet gives us when we put his name all right, the textbooks, this is where we'll probably get in the textbooks as well. And we're in the nationalgalleries.org, and this is what we got. Poor Andrew Fletcher, who's supposed to be a brown complexion man, a brown complexion man. Does this look like a brown complexion man? It's just another white guy here. They keep showing us pale-faced people. Do you see what's going on? Do you understand now the hijack, the level of hijack they got us in? To break the spell, you see how they brainwashed us all our lives. All right, because he's supposed to be a brown complexion man, brown complexion man. And we got the Earl of Perth here as a representative of the ancient and noble family of Drummond. All right, and remember these are ancient noble families. They're not just—I'm not just showing you one person. I'm showing you whole lines. We're talking about people, the whole lineage of brown and black people of Europe. And again, this person is also. He's a middle stature with a quick look, a brown complexion and towards 50 years old, brown complexion. And this is the same person here, James Ruman, fourth Earl of Perth. All right, the Earl of Perth was a Scottish statesman and a Jacobite, a Jacobite, a Jacobite. He was a brown complexion, remember, but look what they're showing us here. Let me just show you. Does it look like brown complexion to you? This is another uh, website with the same person and I just want to show you look at this right here does that look like a brown complexion person to you this is another white guy they're showing us another white guy they're showing us pale face look at that brown complexion really a brown complexion does this look like brown complexion he's so white here come on he needs a tan here and lastly, in this book regarding black or brown complexions, I didn't even look if they had Swarty or any of the other complexions, but, you know, I mean, they're in there probably if they are. And this is Earl of Arrow as a representative of the ancient and noble family of Hay. Again, we already know they're dark if the other guy was the perf as well. All right, it says he, he is the present Earl, has lived retired since the revolution. He is of a brown complexion, middle stature, towards 70 years old. All right, let's go look at what the internet says or the textbook has been showing us all our lives. And right here we got James Hay, 15, Earl of Arrow. Now, this is the picture they got of this person right here, uh, Earl of Arrow, which is the same person. Now, look how white he is. <laughs> wow. Remember, there's supposed to be a brown complexion. The Earl of Arrow is spelled differently with the Hay family. A brown complexion, middle stature. All right, now, with this person right here, look like brown complexion to you. We got to dodge the hijack. This is what I've just been wanting to show you guys. For us, they've been lying to us our whole lives, making us think that everybody was dark skin came out of Africa and that everything, you know, all these slaves and all these people and all these, uh, even these Europeans were all white, but it wasn't like that. Everything's been flipped on us, all right? The whole script. So I hope this video helps, uh, you know, bringing your awareness to this and that we don't really know everything. They've been telling us a lie this whole time. I mean, just look at this image right here. Do you see any brown complexion or anything like that? This person. All right. Who are these people they've been painting? All right. So now you know this video was the black uh, Jacobites. All right. They're described in that time in 1733. That's the way they described even the brown ones. All right. You saw none of them were brown. We showed the images they show us today. This is the same images they're still showing kids our children, everybody in the schools and universities and the textbooks. This is what they're showing in history channels, in college uh, curriculum books. This is the images that they're showing and these people are supposed to be brown and black. Again, does this look like brown or black to you? Does this look like brown or black to you? 
all right and these were black europeans of nobility they were coming over here as indentured servants some of them as jacobites uh prisoners of war right rebels they were being sent over here in the plantations we got that already in the last video make sure you go watch that all right, so we're going to continue with a lot of good videos. I got a lot of very good, interesting videos because this has opened up a whole new thing. All right. We think we know history, but we don't know history. And I'm about to show you guys that. I hope you guys liked, enjoyed this video. Um, thank you for being here in the chat. You know, even though this was not such a long video, I hope you guys liked it and you can use it for a resource and uh, look into it further uh, in your studies. All right, investigations. So have a good night and a, or a good day wherever you are. Much love and blessings. Much love and respect to everybody. Hawa.